morning, everybody. Welcome to our Bible study here at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. It's Sunday morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, please open those to the 18th chapter of Genesis. We're going to be looking at uh, most of our focal material. As a matter of fact, all of the focal material comes from the 19th chapter. But we're going to look at a few verses in the latter part of the 18th chapter, which will help us understand better what's going on as we look at the focal material in the 19th chapter. By way of introduction, life is pretty much the sum total of choices that we make. Nearly every choice we make has a consequence. Some of those are of no significance. Some of the others are extremely significant, pretty much determining the direction that our lives go and the outcomes that we experience from events that happen in our lives. So as we look at our material today, we're going to see some important choices that are made primarily by two different individuals, though there are others, definitely others, involved in what we look at. The um, story of Lot is a story of that profoundly illustrates this point that I'm making, that choices affect our lives. Uh, Lot, remember, made the choice to move when he and Abraham decided that their herds were too large and they needed to separate, he made the choice to move to the fertile plain, uh, grassy lands of the Jordan, which he did, and in doing so, made a choice that was going to very much affect what we talk about here today. Lot also made a bad choice when uh, he was faced with what became some devastating circumstances. We're going to talk about that as we look at our focal material here today. And uh, we will also see that his wife made a bad choice as events developed and she was faced with a direct uh, command and then violated that command and the results were devastating for her. So, as we look at these uh, passages, let's think about choices that we've made. And as we reflect on those choices, think about the ones that you made that have had positive consequences for you and your life and the direction that your life has taken. But also think about those that uh, didn't work out so well, that had negative consequences. I've had all week to think about this topic, and I've spent quite a bit of time reflecting back on both the good and the bad, as well as the consequences that have resulted from my making those decisions and those choices. So with that said, let's look at our background material here. We're going to pick up with the 16th verse of the 18th chapter. And our background material continues all the way through the end of the 19th chapter, the 38th verse of the 19th chapter. And we'll quickly do an overview of all of that and then come back and zero in on the verses that are pretty much in the middle of what we're looking at here. These uh, chapters that we're looking at and verses form a very amazing case in contrast. We see contrast all the way through. Chapter 18, as we mentioned in our background material last Sunday, reveals a visit to Abraham by three, quotes, men. Three men. Turns out they weren't men at all, but uh, we'll talk about that more in a moment. And these three men came announcing to Abraham and 
also to Sarah, that Isaac was going to be born. He would be born within a year. You recall uh, that they told Abraham Sarah was in the tent. She laughed when she heard it, laughed to herself, and then uh, when confronted about why she laughed, she denied that she had, and uh, we'll talk more about that in upcoming weeks. Chapter 19 ends very differently than 18 opens. And 18 opens with very good news, 19 ends with anything but good news. It ends with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and also with an incestual relationship between Lot and his daughters. And so we see the contrast between the obedience of Abraham and we see in contrast to that the uh, hesitancy and obedience of Lot, Abraham's nephew. We also see how seriously God considered sin to be, how he considers it to be, not just past tense, but present tense. God is uh, considers sin to be an anathema, a word so powerful that uh, when we tried to translate it from the Greek, we couldn't, so we just brought it over from the Greek into the English. Horrible. We learned that the three men who visited Abraham were not men at all, as I said earlier. Two of them were angels, and one was the very Lord himself, possibly the pre-incarnate Jesus. I tend to, to side with the people that think that's who it was. In any case, it was uh, God in human form coming to visit with Abraham. They came for three reasons. They came, first of all, to announce the coming birth of Isaac, as we've already mentioned. God had been promising that this would happen for years, decades, and now it's about to happen. Within the next year, Sarah would conceive and give birth to a son, and they were to name him Laughter, Isaac. The second thing that they came the second reason that they came was to evaluate the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, no real reason for the Lord to come. He knew what was going on there, but they did come specifically to give Lot an opportunity to escape what was about to happen there. And then the third uh, thing they came to do was to inform Abraham about what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Number two, they came to evaluate the situation. Number three, they came to tell Abraham, giving Abraham the opportunity that Abraham took advantage of, which was to plead for the righteous people that were in Sodom. And uh, in doing so, he negotiated with the Lord and started out by saying, well, if there are at least 50 righteous people in there, will you withhold the destruction of the city? And the Lord said, yes. And then Abraham says, well, what if there's only 45? And the Lord says, yes. And then Abraham keeps reducing the number and finally gets down to 10. And the Lord said, yes. Well, of course, the Lord knew there weren't 10 there was only one, and that was Abraham, and possibly his daughters, although their behavior would indicate that they weren't righteous either. So one thing for certain, the Scripture makes very, very clear, is that sexual depravity was one of the problems with Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not the only problem, however. In Ezekiel we see that there was the problem with arrogance, there was a problem with pride, and there was a problem with selfishness. These cities were wealthy, 
They prided themselves on their wealth, and they were not at all willing to share the wealth with people that desperately needed it. So God heard the cry, and he responded in accordance with the dictates of sin is an abomination to him. Now, if we read in uh, Peter's second epistle, second chapter, we see that Peter refers to Lot as a righteous person. Now, yes, he probably was righteous, but he was not a pillar of righteousness by any means. So we see him showing great hesitancy. We see him showing great hesitancy in obeying God, being obedient to what God was telling him to do. We also see him as an unwittingly participant in an incestuous relationship with his daughters. Uh, here, he's uh, maybe less guilty of incest, but he's more guilty of drunkenness, both of which, of course, are sinful actions. So with all of that said, let's uh, look at our focal verses. We'll see them as they're presented in the quarterly that we use here at the church. The first uh, set of verses is entitled Urgency. That's Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 17. Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 17. So if you look at those in your Bible, I'm reading from the translation that is in the quarterly, and uh, it's a little bit different than others I consulted this week, but of course not significantly different. Verse 12, Then the angel said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the cry against its people is so great because the Lord, uh, so great before the Lord, that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said. Get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on. Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated because of the Lord's compassion for him. The men grabbed him by his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him out and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, Run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. So Abraham was greatly concerned for the righteous that it were in Sodom. So he negotiated with the Lord, as I said earlier, starting off with 50 and winding up with 10. After the three people, two angels and, and the Lord, left Abraham, the two angels went on to Sodom. They went to the home of Lot and the, the angels, of course, angels serve a multitude of different purposes. The uh, purpose of these angels was to save Lot from what was about to happen in Sodom. And their angels' appearances, that is their, their makeup, their look, is quite different depending on what they're sent to do. These two angels look like ordinary men. And you will recall, if you're familiar with this story, that the men of Sodom wanted to have sex with these men, and they rushed uh, Lot's house. They were trying to break in, and the angels blinded those men that were trying to 
break into Lot's house and made it possible for uh, that whole episode to come to a, a conclusion. Now, these angels showed quite a bit of mercy to Lot and his family. Not just here, but we'll see even more in upcoming verses as they were very patient with them uh, in spite of the fact that they were telling them destruction's coming, it's coming quickly, you need to get out of here, you need to completely vacate the whole plain, get up into the mountains where you'll be protected from what's about to happen. And uh, Lot is a lot more hesitant than he should have been under the circumstances. So we see God showing several things here. Grace for Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. And by the way, depending on which um, translation you look at, one translation thinks that he only had two daughters. They were engaged to the sons-in-law that Lot went and talked to, but had not yet married. You remember the way that marriage worked in that uh, culture was that once women were betrothed, it was like a legal marriage, but they didn't consummate the marriage for another year. Some think that's what it was. Others think that Lot had four daughters, two of whom were already married, and then the two that were at home with him. Um, we don't really know. The language, I'm told by the Hebrew expert that I consult, is difficult to, to determine. I mean, it's not clear. This translation seems to indicate that he had two married daughters and then two that were still virgins living at home. So uh, the angels did not only tell Lot that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were extremely wicked, they also pointed out that the Lord had heard the outcry against the people of Sodom. Uh, that causes Bible uh, experts to ask the question, outcry, where did that outcry come from? Who, who was responsible for the outcry? Uh, one interpretation that I read said that this is the same type of outcry that the Lord mentioned to Cain when he said that your brother's blood cries out to me from from the land, from the ground. So maybe something similar to that has happened in Sodom and the people that were killed, their blood was crying out to the Lord. In any case, God says there has to be punishment for what you're doing, and there will be. I'm going to exercise my judgment upon you, and it's not going to be pleasant for any of you when this happens. And so their sins were extremely serious. Multiple sins, as we've already mentioned, including uh, homosexuality, but also other sins of greed, avarice, and selfishness, pride, the whole list that is mentioned in Ezekiel's uh, prophecies. So God had heard this outcry. And he sent his angels specifically to rescue Lot and Lot's family. Did so in part in response to Abraham's request that this be done. So God is showing grace and mercy and understanding for the men uh, that he has uh, put in a very special position, Abraham. And less so Lot, but still Lot was nephew of Abraham, so because of that, he receives merciful treatment as well. Now, I checked several translations because when it says the sons-in-law were told, it says that they thought he was joking. Well, I thought surely some translation will word that differently. 
No, no. The ones that I consulted all said they thought he was joking. So maybe they thought he was joking, you know, whatever. They were not obedient, and as a result, they died in the uh, result of God's uh, judgment being poured out upon these uh, people in this city. Uh, now, in um, verses 15 and 16, we see at daybreak the angels awakened Lot's family. Well, in that part of the world, this time of the year, that would have been roughly 6 a.m. They urged Lot to take his wife and his two daughters and flee. As we've already said, they, they didn't flee. They were going to be swept away by the results of what was about to happen. This tremendous, tremendous uh, outpouring of God's wrath upon this area. In spite of that, in spite of the fact that these two are angels, he's, Lot's already seen them blind the, the men that were trying to break into the house. He fully understands who he's talking to. He's hesitant. He hesitates. Apparently, none of these people wanted to leave. Not Lot, not his wife, nor the two daughters. They all, to use an uh, euphemism, they dilly-dallied around, didn't get in a hurry. So, um, the angels literally grasp them by the hands and pull them outside of the city where one of the angels told them, run for your lives, run to the mountains, don't stay in the plain. If you do, you're going to be destroyed. And uh, once the, uh, they were told, then Lot continues to dilly-dally and <laughs> not get in a hurry. As a matter of fact, he negotiates with the angels about where he would go rather than running to the, to the mountains. One of the angels said very specifically, when you start running, do not look back. Keep running until you have reached safety outside of the plain. And when they say don't look back, they're talking about more than just glancing over your shoulder. They're talking about looking with a longing for what is about to be destroyed. So th these uh, warnings in many ways parallel what God told Noah prior to the flood. And we'll talk about that more here in a moment. But let's move on to the next set of focal verses under the heading of bargaining in our quarterly, verses 18 through 22. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has indeed found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life. But I can't run, cannot run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to it. <clears throat> it is a small place, isn't it, so that I can survive? And he, the angel, said to him, All right, I'll grant your request about this matter too, and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zoar. Now, Zoar, by the way, is just, just means small in Hebrew. Verses 18 and 19. Lot specifically, <coughs> pardon me, made an appeal by calling himself their servant. He first of all starts off acknowledging that they've been very graceful to him. They've been very kind to him. They've been very understanding. They're trying to save his life. But he says, I can't run to the mountains. It'll take me too long to get there. Uh, this will overtake me and I'll die. Let me go to this little town, which is not very far away. And it's small. 
you can save that town and in doing so save my family and I save our lives so basically what Lot is saying running to the mountains is not an option I can't get there in time and I will die so the angels uh, were very very kind very understanding with Lot and uh, the result is that the angels agreed to grant Lot's request and they did not demolish that little town. Now, we don't know exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah were. We've got a pretty good idea. Most archeologists think they're under the Dead Sea. That is the Dead Sea later on covered that area and there's actually one archeologist right now working to excavate a site that he's fairly certain will turn out to be uh, either Sodom or Gomorrah, one or the others. But in any case, uh, this little town did survive and as a result uh, was around long enough to give evidence of what did take place. So there, there was more to be gained by allowing Lot to go there than just saving Lot's life and his two daughters. But uh, that uh, is because of the archaeological ruins that exist. And uh, the death and destruction were coming. That was certain. Run, they told a, a Lot. Run as fast as you can and don't look back. So God gives us concrete evidence of the report that happened. The charred remains of Sodom disappeared over time, but Zoar has continued and the proof is there that this in fact did take place contrary to those who would like to argue that it, it never happened no no the evidence is pretty overwhelming it did happen as a matter of fact we in recent years have discovered some uh, ancient manuscripts that refer to Sodom and Gomorrah so no doubt but what they did exist the last verses we're going to look at are entitled Judgment, Genesis 19, 23 through 26. And as we look at these verses, we see what is awaiting those who refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their personal saviors, the wrath of God. Verse 23, the sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Zoar. Then out of the sky the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Wow. These should be sobering, eye-opening uh, verses to all of us as we think about what is going to happen one day and we're promised that judgment day is coming and for those of us that are not safe in the Lord it's not going to be very pretty so the angels forced Lot and his family to flee at daybreak as I said earlier probably about 6 a.m. and when they reached Zoar, the sun had risen. Well, that's roughly an hour, maybe a little less than an hour. So the experts think that they made it prob probably somewhere between three to five miles from Sodom to Zoar. As a result, it was far enough away that when the sulfur, burning sulfur, fell, it did not land upon it. And we read in verses 27 and 28 of chapter 19 that the smoke that came up from Sodom and Gomorrah was like the smoke of a, quote, furnace, end quote. So the heat was 
unbelievably intense as um, this sulfur, this uh, hellfire and brimstone fell upon these cities. While fairly close to Sodom, Sodom these, this little town was supernaturally protected by God and his agreement with Abraham. He preserved Lot's life. And, of course, by the time they get there, Lot's wife has been turned into a pillar of salt. So she's no longer with them. Uh, several theories about the pillar of salt, the one that seems to make the most sense is that the intense heat of the cataclysmic event that's going on here vaporized water in the portion of the Dead Sea that did exist at that time. Now, it wasn't very large, and it was much further uh, to the north than where it is today. And it, that salt actually crystallized around his, his wife, turning her into a pillar of salt. And when she says she looked back, that was, as I said earlier, not just a glance. She probably stopped and longingly looked back. As far as we know, she was originally a citizen of, of Sodom. We don't know of him having a wife before he moved there. So she really possibly did not want to leave. But in any case, her life was lost because she wasn't obedient. In this account, as we read here about Sodom and Gomorrah, we see quite a few similarities to the flood account, as I mentioned earlier, and I said we'd talk about these a little more. Both of these accounts, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, deal with a righteous man as a central character. And these righteous people were surrounded by sinful people in both accounts. And in both accounts, it's because of sin that what has to be done is done. The hero prepares for deliverance in uh, Noah's case by building an ark in uh, the case of Lot by fleeing to another town. And we see in both accounts the destruction of wicked humanity. And we see in contrast, the salvation of the righteous family. Now, in Lot's case, family is just two daughters, where in uh, Noah's case, of course, it was three sons and three wives. The righteous children, after being saved, in both cases, uh, abused their inebriated fathers. So, it's so... So many parallels between the two things. Uh, as in the case of the flood, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were going on with their lives in, in a routine manner, uh, not knowing what was about to happen. And when the judgment of God fell on them, in both cases, it was too little, too late. They all were destroyed and None of them were ready for what was about to happen when God sent his judgment. They did not listen when Lot, the righteous man, warned them. They didn't listen when Noah, the righteous man, warned them. So the outcomes were the same. God demolished the cities in the plain. Against the angel's commands, life's wife looked back, possibly stopped longingly looking, and the result was she perished with the others. As far as we know, she was not a righteous lady, so God was not obliged to preserve her life. When we see, when we hear, when we read, when we understand the good news of the gospel, we should share it with the rest of the world. We shouldn't be hesitant. We should let the rest know what is about to happen someday, in some way, God is going to fulfill his promise that the righteous will be saved 
and those that are not righteous will be dealing with the consequences of their sins. Sin is, as I said earlier, an anathema to God. And he will one day totally abolish it. So, we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, that God will return, and when he does, it's going to happen suddenly. It will be Christ that comes back, God in the form of Christ. Remember, God presents himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as with Sodom and Gomorrah, when he appears, it's going to be eternally too late for those of us that haven't made him our Lord and our Savior. So if we're not offered forgiveness through Christ, we will be eternally separated from God. And everything that's good, everything that's desirable, everything that's lovely comes from God. James tells us that all good and perfect gifts come from the Father. By being in him, we one day will have nothing but the good, and those that are not in him, have not received him as Lord, will have everything but the good. Thank you for listening today. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. You demonstrate to us, Lord, in these verses we've studied here today that you are very caring, very loving. You give even someone like Lot who was so hesitant to be obedient to you. You give him the grace that he doesn't deserve just as you give us the grace and give me the grace, Lord, that I don't deserve through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, I pray that anybody that's hearing these words today that has not made you the Lord of their life, that today, right now, Lord, is the time that they will do it. They will invite you to come into their lives. They'll pray that prayer, Lord, first of all, asking you to forgive them for their sins, and then saying that they want to receive you as their Lord and Savior, inviting you to come into their lives, and transform them, Father, into the people that you would have them to be, and they will make that public. They will do it with public profession of faith and with public baptism. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I thank you for all the blessings that are ours, and most of all, the gift of eternal life through you. It's in your Son's name, O oh Lord, that I pray. Amen.